I'm not answering her question or if um, it might be more helpful to get some words of wisdom from other family members, we may turn the floor over to them as well. Yes, awesome. All right, let's get us started. Um, and so I see, perfect. Um, I have a question about payment for classes. Um, and I see that is from Darpana. I hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um, and so I'm going to assume in terms of the question, are we looking at specifically billing? Are we asking more specifically about financial aid? Um, can you expand a little bit more? If you can. Hi. Hi. Can you hear you are. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for arranging this. It's really helpful. Um, uh, this is like, I mean, I haven't, uh, you know, done my undergraduation from this country, so it is a little different here. Um, so, um, and then my son ha has taken admission at UMBC first year. Uh, uh, he uh, was uh, undecided first for the major, um, and then he decided computer science, but when it was enrolling, enrollment, he enrolled in finance. Uh, 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 and uh, he told uh, the person who was enrolling that uh, he's not so sure. So the classes were, uh, but the uh, the person who was for the orientation, he said like you got you got to enroll as a full timer, uh, mm. so that uh, for the admission you have to take at least the classes now. Just enroll it and then you can drop it. So um, I'm not sure now, uh, you know, and then we are not sure how to pay the fees and everything because. I think the payment must be showing for the classes what he's taken, and he still has to take advanced uh, placement test for the computer science, and um, uh, he's going to take it tomorrow. So after that, he's going to uh, take the classes, like enroll for the classes in computer science. So um, I'm not sure, like you know, what to do for the uh, fees and um, how to go about it. I'm really sorry to ask you this question, but. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great so question. it's a great question. And even if you are familiar with the billing, um, it is almost embarrassing for me to say, but billing is um, one of the hardest things to understand. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for that. So even if you were familiar with the education, you know, billing in this country or particularly at our school, this time of year, students' bills can change. So if you sign up for three classes and they see that you're part-time, you're gonna get billed by the credit hour. If you go up to full-time, you're gonna get billed that full-time and the more classes you add, you don't get billed anymore. And there's fees that kick in based on part-time or full-time. So it sounds like the advice that your student got was actually on target in terms of making sure they're full-time and then they can trade out classes if you want your bill to be stable. So, Double check that, but if your bill changes within this time period, it's because we don't want to ch uh, charge students for classes they're not taking. If there's financial aid, it's really, really important to be full time because your aid changes if you drop down to part time. So I think I I'm trying to answer questions that you didn't ask, but I think might be embedded in what I heard um, to make sure that I'm giving good information. Finally, when you do go to pay your bill, one of the puzzling things to most people is that we do everything on your student's account in the computer. <laughs> so the only time you're going to get a paper bill is if a bill hasn't been paid for a really long time and we know that the student's no longer here. And one of the things at orientation that they were told many times, but they're so stressed out, they may not really hear it yet or, or excited or whatever emotion they're feeling. Sometimes it's a big hairball of excitement and stress. And so um, you need to make sure that your student can get into that account and show you the bill and how it's changing. And most importantly, what the due date is. When you change your bill, the due dates sometimes can change. So you just have to be in that um, digital bill, making sure you're keeping up with that. If you pay a part time bill and then you go to full time, it's going to automatically adjust. So it's not problematic to go ahead and pay a bill if you need to meet the billing due date. Um, but you want to make sure that you're keeping up with that. Your student can give you authorization to see their account. Um, Fritzy's probably better at telling you how to do that, or one of our parents might be better at telling you how to do that than I am. 
Um, but the bills, you are not alone in not understanding all that. Um, and you're, everything changes. I'm just going to tell you everything changes yeah. at this time of year based on how your student is registering. And Was that helpful or not? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so he's actually uh, uh, enrolled for full timers, so, but then I'm not sure when, by, uh, till when shall I wait till, to, to pay the bill? Shall I wait till the time uh, he enrolls mm -hmm. in the computer science, uh, uh, you know, the subject, or shall I just go ahead and pay it? Uh, and is there anyone I can contact if I am? Yes. Like to yes. Yeah, so let me jump in right now. So typically the way billing works is that they issue a bill at the start of the, the month. And so usually I think it's by the fifth day of the month, you will get it, your student will get an e-bill. And Nancy's correct, your student can authorize you to receive those bills. So you will, if you are authorized by your student to receive those bills, you will get it. You have until the 20th of that month to pay your bill um, for that month. And so if there's something that you have a question about, perhaps, you know, there's going to be some fluctuation or changes, the best people to reach out to is student business services. Um, and I'm happy I will drop their information in, their, in the chat really quickly after I'm done talking. Um, but they are wonderful with working with families, with students um, in regards to any questions that you may have. I always tell students and families if there is some sort of financial situation that you're experiencing and perhaps you're worried that maybe I'm not going to be able to get to that bill on the 20th, I would say the best thing to do is to give them a call. They are super great about working with families regardless of what the situation is. And so, um, you know, that is definitely what I would recommend and your student has the ability to share their profile with you through my UMBC. Um, and that is how you would then log in to see that information. So hopefully that clarifies it a little bit more. Nancy, did you want to add? Uh, the only thing there? I wanted to add on that wonderfulness of that, that staff, <laughs> students often um, will ignore a bill. I know that's shocking to many of you, but sometimes students get messages about important things and don't pay attention to them really well. And what we would love your help in helping your student to learn how to manage bills. They've got four years to figure that out if you're helping them. And if you're on this screen, you probably are at least coaching them in some way. And um, as long as, even if that billing date is coming up, as long as you've called them and are explaining what you're doing, I've never seen them not work with a family. Mm -hmm. When we end up with issues is when the billing due date passes and people don't call and they've reached out and we don't hear anything, that ends up in a place where there's late fees and other kind of things that none of us want you to get. But we are in a state system that requires us to do a certain number of things. Um, and, and then that's really not within our control. So if you call and we've heard from you, we've got all sorts of flexibilities. If your student calls and we've heard from them, if you just want to coach them, and we've got all sorts of flexibility. But if we if it just goes and then it's way past or or there wasn't a question asked, it's a little harder to help. Yes, absolutely. I love the thank billing you. talk. <laughs> thank you so much. This was really helpful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I see another billing question. I'll just jump in with that. The online bill mentions pending financial aid that we should pay the difference between the bill and the financial aid. Um, so say you're, you have a $5,000 bill and 3,000 uh, financial aid, we pay 2,000 numbers made up, of course. Um, yes, and so, you know, typically what will happen, you will see the pending aid on your bill um, and actually on the family connection portal. I just posted this week the disbursement dates for financial aid. So you'll see that information in the portal on the um, calendar on the right hand side. Um, and so that information should be applied to the bill. And you would see that as, I don't think it's called, I don't want to say credit, but it's basically aid that is added to your bill and deducted from your bill. Um, scholarships are typically around the same depending on specific scholarships. Um, and so what, if your student is expecting a specific scholarship, obviously, um, you know, always confirming with the financial aid office, kind of the timing of that scholarship. Um, and if there is some sort of discrepancy, again, just following up with student business services to inform them that, hey, we have a scholarship that's coming in. It's not being reflected. We're working with financial aid. And again, as Nancy mentioned, they will work with you 
so much on those things because they understand that these things sometimes take time. So um, I'm going to, before we, uh, I wanted to jump into but another Before piece. you do, Fritzi, I just yeah. want to clarify mm -hmm. one thing about scholarships. When we say yeah. scholarships, we're talking about UMBC scholarships. Mm -hmm. We also have students that will come in with scholarship support from a temple, a church, a mosque, a community organization. And each one of those differs, whether they give that money directly to you or send that to the school. So if you have any of those sort of unique scholarships right. that happen outside of UMBC, you want to check with the um, people who have awarded that to your student to make sure that um, you know how that's happening. 100%. And I just want to, because this actually came up in a lot of the questions that I saw our topics expressed um, in the registration, was that information about sharing access to billing, access to grades, and how families get access access to that information. And so um, I wanted to just briefly mention that um, all UMBC students are able to share or grant access to parent or family member um, to give them access to their billing um, and their grade information. That is done through My UMBC. So your student would actually have to send you an invitation through My UMBC. You would need a Gmail or a Facebook account um, as part of your login. Um, so what would happen, your student sends out the invitation, you receive it, and you would then be invited to log in via your Facebook or your Gmail account information. That grants you access into our internal system of my UMBC, and there you would be able to see, obviously, the billing information. A lot of it's not there now, right, <laughs> because we're not in se semester. Um, and then um, grades information, um, and that is the, like, end of semester grades. Um, a lot of times families um, will ask about, well, I don't see anything. Well, if grades haven't been posted yet, you won't see anything. Typically, grade information is posted at the end of the semester. Um, and so that is something that is um, we've shared in the portal. I'm happy to drop the link to that information from the portal in the chat as well, but just wanted to briefly mention it because it came up a few times in the, in the registration information. Um, jumping ahead, Nancy, there was a lot of questions about moving. <laughs> Um, we had questions about move-in times. Uh, what is move-in day like? I do uh, what see do we, we, bring? Skipped, we skipped one question about <laughs> scholarships. And oh, while yeah. we're on the finances, let's just wrap that up. And then I'm excited yeah, sure. to talk about move-in. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, my son received the UMBC scholarship, but it does not show up as a credit on the bill. I guess I need to contact student business services. Um, yes, I would definitely connect with, um, well, first and foremost, I would just double check with you and uh, the financial aid office. Um, to just make sure that the scholarship has been applied. I, I know that the disbursement dates were just released this week, so it just may be that they hadn't posted it yet. So I would say if by, you know, uh, double check with them to see when those disbursement dates are, and if they have posted it, then absolutely follow up with student business services to say, hey, I'm not seeing this on our bill. Um, can you assist us? Um, yep. Yeah. Great, so now that we've got the fun stuff of billing out of the way, um, you know, the um, move-in day is a really exciting day. And you should have already started getting some letters from Residential Life if your student is a resident. You shouldn't have gotten them. Your student should have gotten them. Telling them the kinds of health things that you heard about at orientation if you attended, uh, that they have to get prepared for submitting and doing all that work before they move in. The exciting thing about move-in day is that it's also commuter welcome day. So if there are any families or parent here from commuters, that move-in day and that welcome day for commuters are the same because that is also the kickoff for welcome week. So um, regardless of who you are, we're gonna be talking about move-in, but here in the back of your head, that's the day my commuting student also needs to be here to get connected to those welcome week activities. So on move-in day, yes, you are allowed to have two cars, but we would ask you to quickly um, unload and load. Um, you literally dump stuff off. There will be moving <laughs> folks out there with carts and all sorts of things. You're gonna load that, all your stuff in a cart or dump your stuff under a tent. We recommend that you bring more than one person. And this might be a great way for some of our family board members to chime in about what the day was really like for them. Um, and then you, get directed to a parking lot. So you need a driver who's gonna take that car to the parking lot and walk by and you need somebody to stay with the stuff. 
And <laughs> so that's usually you're good if it's you and your student. If you bring more people than that, it's great. And um, so the parking lots are really far away, but certainly you're going to um, uh, do that. And then there's a shuttle if we have to use the far lots that will bring you back. Um, but it's a smooth system. We usually get great compliments. Uh, last year, when we weren't real fresh from having had COVID for a little while, uh, a couple of places had lines, but that we had it fixed right away. And then after you move in, you're going to want that car to be far away so you can stay for a while because all day long we have Retriever Fest and an opportunity for you, your students, and others just to do another check-in with um, services and to get some welcome gifts and take a family photo so that you leave with a great memory of the day. Yes, and there was an additional question about move-in time. So your student would have received that information um, in their room assignment uh, and all the roommate information that was shared, um, I believe, in mid-July. So each student is assigned a specific move-in time um, because we try, we try not to have everybody come in at the same time, right, to minimize traffic on campus. So you report at your move-in time, and as Nancy mentioned, um, it's like organized chaos. <laughs> um, it's really, um, there's, there's going to be a lot of energy, a lot of people, um, and the other side of the moving experience that I know our families um, want to know more about, um, you know, is, you know, once you kind of get to the room, what do we do? Do we stay around? Do we, it depends on what your student wants and needs in that moment. A lot of times students, you know, you may have a student that wants to, you to hang up every poster, <laughs> unpack every box with them. Um, and then you may have the student who is, I just need a little bit of time to process and this is a little overwhelming. And so I don't want to do all this right now. Um, and so it really just depends on kind of where your student is. But a lot of times I think family take the moment to to, to just kind of enjoy and savor this really great occasion uh, with their student. And then once they are finished in the residence hall, they make their way over to Retriever Fest. And, and they really, uh, we have the hospitality tent for families, and that's really for you all to catch your breath from the day. We know this is such a huge moment. Um, and so we want to make sure that you all have an opportunity um, to celebrate if you're super excited about, you know, that last student being <laughs> handed off to college or if you're a little sad about, you know, you're, you know, leaving your, your baby um, with us. And so um, the family advisory board is there as well to celebrate and, and support with you too. And I think I see Camille and Joyce, who are two family advisory board members that are here. And so Camille or Joyce, did you want to add anything that we may have missed? Hmm? I see Monica. Can you guys hear me? No, you yes, guys pretty much. Here. You guys pretty much covered it. It was like you said, organized chaos. A lot of people are there to help you and guide you, so you're not going to miss anything. The signs are the great signage in terms of where to park, who to see, what to do. So don't fear in terms of it. It's nice that you have the time selection. Everything moved pretty smoothly. No complaints in terms of it. It's just a lot of people, a lot of energy, and it's fun. So you'll have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> And I think I saw a hand up from Monica. Yeah, I'm a new advisory board member, so yes! hello. I just joined this <laughs> week. Um, I'm a parent of a sophomore as well. So I did this yesterday, or we did this last year, and I will say that it was really smooth. Um, I know everybody was really nervous in our family about it, um, but UMBC has it well orchestrated. And I was going to say the one thing that we didn't realize, and we were really, really thankful, is all the dorms have like bins. So once you get like moving in line, you go and you get a bin, you fill up everything. I will note that boys tend to fill one bin up and that's it. But the girls had so much more stuff. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to add with somebody said about buying stuff. I would really wait to buy a lot of the stuff besides their clothing, um, laptop, school supplies um, and bedding. A lot of the stuff came home unused. Um, he just didn't use it. So, so like <laughs> cleaning products, which I wasn't happy about, but they just, <laughs> this, I guess, didn't clean much. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, in what we do, we actually study. And I wish this little, my 70s self, um, having grown up with all the things about equality and everything, but there's still a study that says men are far less likely to wash their sheets regularly than the girls, too. So maybe he didn't have to unpack the second second batch. So 
Um, we, we also try, and I say that laughingly, but part of our job in res halls is to help people learn how to be independent and to do all those sort of instrumental things about keeping themselves. So um, sending some instructions with them about how to do laundry uh, might also be things on your list if that wasn't something they already did at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can, let me say a couple things about the checklist and why the unload time is so critical. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> it, it may not seem like it, but when we're trying to get 3,500 people moved in in one weekend, if everybody parks their car in the front of a residence hall, you are going to be walking your stuff from the admin building. And our goal is to get you as close to that door where you have to move things in. And so if you can unload your car and you are going to be amazed that even if your student only brings their clothing and their books and their items that fit in a car, it takes a little while to unload them into the building. Um, most of you will either have to go up or down a flight of steps or up or down an elevator, depending on how you choose to move. And so that ability to use that time limit, they don't shoo you out at exactly 16 minutes, but 15 minutes probably means you're moving by 20. And um, it does just help keep the day moving. And then once your car is moved, you can enjoy Retriever Fest, meet other families, be there when your student meets their roommate, and um, just have a more enjoyable day. And, and we've found over time that this orchestration really, really helps make the day very pleasant. Yes, great, thank you. Um, another question that came up that I would love for your feedback on, Nancy, is there was a question about adjustment in the hall. So what, what is available for students who may be the first time living at home, living away from home, and maybe needing some additional supports living on campus? And there was also an additional flip side to that, obviously, commuter students as well. Yeah. So um, let me start with commuter students, because we've been talking all about residents, and I'm super excited about our commuting students. And we've just hired an amazing new staff member who's not new, but from the residence halls to move over to commuters to help us with that. So it's going to be a seamless experience. Um, and at 2 o'clock, while Retriever Fest is still going on, commuters will come to campus. They will have some get acquainted activities. And the reason Retriever Fest ends at 4 is that the commuter get acquainted time ends at the same time that we want families and parents to begin departing from the residences. Most commuters will show up with friends or maybe on their own. Um, and so at that point, we really want the students, the residents will go to floor meetings, but this is all designed that we're all heading towards dinner together and then to an amazing evening of activities. The activities in the evening are a huge get acquainted event that every student that's ever gone through it. And we've been doing this since 1986. The same activity and every year when we do our surveys and even when COVID after COVID, we said to our upper class students, what one thing must we do during welcome week? And they all said play fair. Play fair is this giant, giant hundreds of kids on the lawn or if it rains inside our arena um, with a person saying, everybody find their birthday month. Now introduce yourself to three people. And it sounds odd, but even our shyest kids do it. And many students talk about just getting really comfortable at that event with meeting new people. We do know that we have students with anxiety and some students that may be on the spectrum that that's a little hard for. And we still say, come on down. And we've watched those students enjoy it from the sidelines and then get involved in some of the smaller activities. And we have a way of making that work for all of our students. And at the end of it, this is a secret. So please don't, I, you, you know, how am I going to trust parents not to tell their students? But um, we always surprise them at the end with fireworks. Um, and it's, a, it's just a really exciting way to start their semester. The commuters then go off to home so they can come back with us the next day to welcome week in groups that they've now met people. The residents go back to their residence halls to get to know each other a little bit more. And then the next day on Sunday kicks off with lots more activities for them to do. Um, everything from learning how to manage the 
the different cultures and different ways of being and identities that we have at UMBC, because for many of our students, they haven't had to do that before. And into how they do their academic toolkits and um, what we expect of them in terms of following rules and some of that stuff. You know, when you get angry at your sibling, you just yell at them and you might even punch them in the arm, depending on where, what kind of sibling relationship you have. You do that to your roommate and you're going to get kicked out of school. So we try to help them understand that this is a real time of change during these days. And then every night have something social that's really fun that they can do. And it's anything from a movie where we know a lot of our quieter students want to go somewhere with someone, but may not be as comfortable going to a dance or something. And then we have those other more active. We have our sports arena open for people to work out. Um, so for those of you that have a shy one or an anxious one, you'll want to push them as hard as you can to get involved in all of this stuff. And you should. And I hope you will push them in ways that say it's OK to just go and watch. It's OK to go and and get used to it. It's OK to go with one roommate. Um, it's OK. Because what we have found over time is sometimes the quieter young person that's sitting at the side of the room listening and not being very participative is the one at the end can tell us everything we said. Um, so, however, a students ready to participate, we want them to. OK, so that's the 1st few days. On the 2nd, um, weeks. I guarantee you, if you've got an outgoing student, they're going to be calling you saying, I'm having the time of my life. And you need to start talking with them about whether they're going to class and studying. You're also going to get students like my nephew who called and said, please come get me. And my brother wanted to go pick him up. And I said, over my dead body. Like you leave him there. And part of why his mean aunt said that was that even though I knew he was an anxious kid and a shy kid, that if you don't get connected in those first weeks, it becomes much harder to do so. So a couple weeks in, we've got something called Involvement Fest. And the social structure at UMBC works very much about cl around clubs and organizations. And students tend to cluster with the first people they met at Welcome Week, whether they like them or not. It's just somebody to latch on to. And if they don't latch on, they don't get connected to the rest of the network. So let us know and we'll get their RA or their commuter assistant involved and try to get them connected. But at Involvement Fest, once they get connected to organizations, they've got to be brave enough to go to that first organization meeting. And if they go back for two or three organizations, they're going to be fine. I'm telling you, they're going to be fine because they're going to get connected. They're going to start meeting other people. And then somewhere around October and November, they realize they didn't like that group, but they met somebody in that group that knew somebody in another group. And it's off and running. By December, they either love it or hate it. And no matter what, make them come back in January because they go home, they figure out if this is a resident student, they'll go home and they'll figure out that mm, their friends had different experiences and they come back in February. And it's really not until February that most new students really settle in um, because now they've had that experience. They come back, they feel like they know what they're doing and they realize that they're a little bit different than they were when they left. So that's my long winded answer about how you get your student involved. If you have a student that doesn't get involved, please call us. I mean, I've got a young man right now that after his first semester, he isn't involved at all. And he's got some really unique challenges in doing that. And I've been meeting with him every week, coaching him on how to just say hello. Um, because even though I'm the vice president, I got into this work because I love students and those students give me a way to stay connected. And all of us will do that for your students if they need help. Now, the last thing I'm going to say is for the commuters, they can park anywhere they want because we're not given tickets that day, um, but they'll be told where to do that. And um, as long as they aren't parking in a 15 minute resident move in space, they're going to be fine. They're going to get T-shirts that identify them as a commuters. And the reason we do this before welcome week is the residents get to know each other on those floors. And what we saw is individual commuters walk in, see other students talking to each other and walk out. So we really want your commuting student to come to that two o'clock event 
because if they get to know other students, then they're going to have their commuter T-shirt just like the resident students do. And then when they walk to the commuting events and the welcome week events on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, they've also got a group and they don't have to walk in alone. All right. Did I miss anything? No, you, so you're keeping you caught track up. of the questions. Yeah. You caught the first. So there's a couple of questions about folks who have afternoon move-in times, but want to participate in Retriever Fest, and there's concern about whether or not they can, should they show up early for Retriever Fest, do that first, then proceed to their move-in time. Um, and so thoughts on that, Nancy? I know yeah. we have some families do that. We, we do. I would um, call Res Life and see if they've got an earlier time for you if you'd like to do that. We try to keep the move in times um, relatively spread apart and we do it by floors. So we know that floors two and three both have to go up. So we're, we move floor two in with the basement floor and floor one in with. So we're trying to control traffic in ways that help you not be congested. And if you come really early and you want to park in another lot, that's great. I don't know. We're a relatively safe campus and we haven't had real problems on move-in day, but probably that's because we always encourage people not to leave lots of stuff parked on our outer loops or other places um, before you move in. Um, but you're certainly welcome to do that if you choose to. My better advice, we don't have any move-in times usually after two o'clock. So my better advice might be that by about 1.30, usually the 12 to two group is done and the, you know, that last group hasn't started to stack up yet. So since you're talking to me today, you might have inside scoop. <laughs> Nobody's going to stop you if you come half an hour early. So then you'll still have a little time. I, you know, we have occasionally run out of some of the best giveaways. At the end, we always get more than we need, but unfortunately, sometimes people will come back twice because they really <laughs> want two bears instead of one. And, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so you're welcome to, but if you do, please park and don't go through the lines if there's, you know, if it's not your time um, or call and get an earlier time or show up, park in a nearby lot, go to all the stuff and then move your car back into for the move in time. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a great point. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I want, I saw a question really quickly about the installment plan, just reverting back to, to, to billing really quickly. I think we missed that in the beginning. Um, and there was a question about, uh, the payment plan. Um, and so, um, I know, um, and it looks like Myra, um, you had a question about, um, regarding the installment plan. Did you want to expand a little bit on that? Myra's still here. Oh, yes. Uh huh. Yes. Thank Hi. you. Yes. Thank you so much for having this forum. I appreciate it. It's very helpful. Um, so, just with the installment plan, um, so you have to kind of make, I guess, an estimate sort of of what the tuition is going to be, your, you know, mm -hmm. your fees, your room and board. So, if the student then receives maybe additional outside scholarships outside of UMBC after that, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. are you refunded? The money or the credit it to the account. Um, how does that work in terms of the installment? Because it's a set amount that you've now kind of committed to, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So how does that work if there is additional funds coming in? Thank you. This great question. Um, so students will who have uh, obviously additional monies that are applied to the account do receive a refund, <laughs> um, and it comes in form of it's not a check that's mailed to them. It's actually um, going to be however they've asked to receive their refund. And so I would just have a conversation with your student about um, where you would like that money sent to. So if you have like a, a specific account or credit card that you would like that money credited to, that's where it would go. They would not like say, in, for instance, credit credit it for the like hold that money for the next semester or anything like that. It is issued as a refund, and so the student once they set up their account will have to determine where they would like any refunds to be sent. And so just make sure that you've set that up appropriately with your student. Does that help, Myra? Okay. Yes. Yes, that does. All right. Awesome. <clears throat> You're welcome. Let me make sure it is not another question that popped in while I was chatting. Um, I had some really, there is, uh, oh, some COVID. I knew those were going to come in. COVID um, uh, 19 precautions and restrictions. Um, you know, are there going to be any changes that you can forecast for us, Nancy, particularly regarding the masking requirement or any other precautions that you um, can share? 
It's a great question and it's perfectly timed. Um, we have we have been um, relatively conservative because we are lucky to have the epidemiologists that has advised governors all over the country um, on how to manage COVID on our staff. So you've certainly seen UMBC to most people's happiness, to a few people's unhappiness, um, managing um, with masking and other things in ways other places have not. Our principle had, has been to try to get students back to as much of a sense of normalcy as fast as we can while protecting the most vulnerable amongst us. And we are now using CDC's color coding for high, low, and medium and the recommendations that they use. Right now, we are back to high in some high areas of transmission, particularly in Howard community, uh, Howard around us, and many of our staff have been out sick. The new variant is highly transmissible, but luckily less lethal, but certainly if you're vulnerable, less lethal doesn't matter. So we have at this point still requiring masks only in classrooms. And our logic with that has been following the recommendations, but making sure that in environments that you don't have a choice, right? You have a choice of doing almost anything else or eating at an off time or picking a meal. And while we'd like everybody to be able to be social and involved in everything, you cannot avoid class and still get good grades and get what you paid for. And so until we get to low levels of COVID, Masking is required in the classrooms. Today, our provost and our the chair of our COVID committee is meeting with the SGA president and others to get student feedback on what they want to have happen. Um, students certainly are less vulnerable. Most students, we recognize that some of our students are very vulnerable because we we know who we're treating and health records and who's asked for our support. And so we are still doing this very delicate balance of making sure that um, we're able to let students make really good choices, get back to some level of physical norm normalcy at the same time, making sure that, you know, students have choices who need to take care of their health in a little bit different way. So that was a pretty vague answer. If there's other specific things about COVID, I'm happy to answer it. And we typically through the, um, the university does a really excellent job of communicating out any changes to the broader campus community. So, um, and, and it's usually done, done in a really thoughtful way. And so whatever information that we share out with students and with community members, um, I also share that out with families so that you all know what's happening and what the changes are. Um, and so um, that is something that we try to make sure that you all are kept uh, abreast of um, because we know that the health and safety of our, our, our students are our number one priority. So um, following that, I know I see a question about fall classes and we're gonna switch to academics here in a second, but um, I saw another question pop in, Nancy, about isolation time and how, how do students who may live on campus isolate um, and, you know, can they attend classes remotely? Those kind of questions. If something got, you know, um, sure. uh, the student is unfortunately um, exposed to COVID. Sure. So, you know, given that the whole world is moving back to some level of normalcy around COVID, we are asking, and, and because we know that there are treatments uh, in public health, the point of managing an illness once it's once it's spreading, you know, you try to manage it with no transmission when it's early. But once you're beyond that point, which we were with COVID very early in this um, across the world, um, what you're really trying to do is manage the severe illness, the overwhelm of the medical system until we can get vaccines and treatments. So the goal then switches from transmission to controlling um, severe outcomes. And along with that comes more personal responsibility and less societal responsibility once people have the means to take care of themselves. So just like the rest of the world, we are transferring to more personal responsibility. What that means is that if a student right now were to send in before we would have called them up, we'd have taken them to an isolation room. Now they're going to get a message back that tells them what to do tells them who they should call because these are new directives from our health department 
And um, that's going to be true for resident students as well. It means that we are keeping a more limited number of quarantine and isolation beds. We um, serve students from all over the world and from all generational kinds of homes and from all classes and economic levels. But the quarantine and isolation this year will be limited to students who cannot isolate or quarantine at home. What that means is if other people at your home have already had COVID or if um, you, you have a place where that student can stay in their own room, we're going to ask that student to go home under the amazing care of their family, which is probably where a lot of families want them. That wasn't true at the beginning of COVID. A lot of families were like, stay at school. We don't want you here. Um, however, we will maintain quarantine and isolation for out of state students, international students, and students who might have an immunocompromised family member or grandparent living at home with them that really is at too high a risk for them to go home. But those spaces will be a little more limited than we had when we were only having half of our population. We, we only had, I think, 25% of our population living on campus at one point. Did that answer the question about the quarantine and isolation? I think so. Okay. Let's know in the chat. Um, and so I, we had some questions definitely come up about academic um, transition. Um, and so one question that came up, not only in the chat, but also in some of the questions that were sent ahead of time is who a student works with in regards to their schedule. Um, if you know, they need to make changes, perhaps maybe change a major and those things. Who's the student supposed to be working out work, reaching out to, to do that. And so, um, I know that each student. As part of the orientation process, once they've completed their on per in person orientation session, they had an invite they should have had um, an advising appointment, um, and then they were went ahead and selected their schedule. Moving forward, if they need additional support, we have a wonderful advising office, and again, I'll drop that information in the chat, um, and they will help guide your student if they are concerned about what classes to select or making any specific changes to their major and things of that nature. Um, so the advising office does a really wonderful job. Um, as your student gets further along, they will get assigned a specific advisor. Um, but in the earlier stages, if you're looking for someone to reach out to just in general and get some support, the advising office is going to be the best place to reach out to. Um, the other question that I see the last day to register for fall classes. The last day to make any changes to your schedule is September 14th. Um, and so we obviously, you know, would want our students to do their best to get their schedule squared away and set, settled um, as early as possible. Um, even though they have until the 14th, you know, um, you know, I would not advise waiting that late <laughs> just simply because the classes have already started. Um, and they would then be having to catch up. And so um, if there is a concern about a late registration and things like that, I think the best thing for um, the student to do is obviously most certainly talk with the advisor, get some guidance there. Um, and then I'm going to talk about our academic success center in a moment, um, our academic advocates as well as another resource that might be helpful in the future. Anything that you wanted to add to that, Nancy? No, that sounds good. Um, the, the, the only thing I'm going to say again is you've got shy students, you've got assertive students, we've got all kinds of students. The biggest thing I see was two things with students changing their schedules. I think families should be aware of, and it's the student that goes to orientation and gets really good advice about what courses they should take and goes home and talks to someone else and changes all their classes. And inevitably, they end up with Fritzy at the end of the semester saying, <laughs> I don't understand why I did so poorly. And it's we're kind of like, well, because you got placed where you're supposed to be, but you didn't, you wanted to take five science classes in your first semester. And we advised you not to do that, but that's really hard. So if you have those kind of questions, we welcome sitting and talking. And if you really do just think the schedule is not right, We'd love to hear from people before we change those. Now, that doesn't mean if a student switches out a class because the one they wanted was open and it wasn't open before. 
but people do spend a lot of time and we don't always see eye to eye, but that advising is based on years of experience and every single person in the world of our students, because they're really bright and they're really hardworking, thinks they're the exception to the rule. <laughs> and there are exceptions to the rule. We have seen students do that and do really well, but it's not normal. So we would prefer to talk with them and coach them through that. And then if they really do it, that's okay, but just to make sure that the thinking um, really, really is working well. So that's one thing about advising. Now back to the shy and the anxious. Um, that was my nephew, so I spent a lot of time on the shy and the anxious. Is that um, those those resources are there, but they will they will say things like, "But when I was at summer orientation, they told me my advisor was in this department, and that advisor didn't call me back." And or that advisor didn't well, not all the faculty advisors are on campus all in the summer. They are 10 month contracts. They don't work all all year long. Many of them. So if they're having that issue and we try to get them to advising center and they need a little help getting motivated, um, please reach out and make sure we're pushing them to get to that place. Um, because sometimes they are a little hesitant to do something even out of the norm. And part of our job is to help them understand how to navigate systems and to figure out how to get help when the original help isn't there. Yes, absolutely. Um, and really quickly, there were some questions about the Academic Success Center, and I know it may be a little confusing. You have academic advising, you have <laughs> your student's academic department, then you have the Academic Success Center, and what do all these things mean and how do they all work together? Um, and so, in reality, it's almost like a triage. We all collaboratively work together to support your students. And so the Academic Success Center is a great resource for those students who, who may just be needing some additional support. So perhaps, you know, they are having a really challenging situation and they're not quite sure whether that be about their major, whether that be they need to take a reduced course load. Maybe they're really struggling with that math class. Maybe they're struggling with time management or study skills and things of that nature. And so. Um, we have what is called academic advocates who actually work with students um, on a variety of topics and offer support and guidance. And so they will sit down and listen with your um, meet with your student and discuss what their issues are. And then they will actually then, you know, reach out to the different resources on campus and get that student connected. And so perhaps they need a tutor. Um, perhaps they need uh, to get connected to a study group. Um, maybe they need, do need to sit down and meet with an advisor. So the academic advocate pr 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 plays the role of helping the student manage um, some of the different resources on campus. So if your student is struggling academically early on in the beginning, I would say that is the best place to send them um, so that they can get the support that they need. We can catch it early on, um, and then they can then hopefully um, have a successful experience moving forward in the semester. And so the Academic Success Center is definitely something to leverage, um, and they manage our, our writing center, our tutors, um, as well as a, a variety of the other kind of academic policies and, and things. So for, for whatever reason, perhaps your student has an emergency and would need to do a, a late withdrawal or something's going on, um, the Academic Success Center helps students manage some of those issues that come up that are unforeseen. Um, so a really great resource that I wanted to recommend and highlight. The other thing you may see, um, we do mid semester interventions with first year yep. students. And we also know that students are not very good at asking for help um, in their first semester. And some of that's because they've always done really well. Some of it might be because they're depressed. Some, for, but for whatever reasons, at mid semester, we ask faculty to report on the 1st test grade or the 1st paper grade. So that if we see students early that aren't being successful, they're going to get a letter that asks them to reach out to 1 of the folks in that department. It will hit them hard and when it does, I hope you will tell them that Nancy sitting in front of you. Dr. Young failed her 1st semester calculus exam and she still went on to get a PhD and did just fine. <laughs> And I say those things because at a high achieving school, one of the biggest reasons students don't ask for help is they feel like a failure. Mm -hmm. And they don't know how to say that I've, you know, I've done well, or I'm smart and I should be, this should be easier for me. And so I tell them that story about me 
because I want them to know if you're here, whether you did well in high school or not, whether you're depressed, whether you're um, just not know how to make this transition, you have what it takes to be here. And if you struggle, we want to get in there early and get you help. We know that about over 85% of our faculty for first year students, it's, it's approaching 90% actually report those grades. So it doesn't help if they, if they don't really fall off until the end of the semester, but it does give us an opportunity and students hear that as I'm in trouble, you know, they're calling me in and I hope you will help us get them to read that letter a little more carefully where it says, we just want to help you and get you back on track. And there's no shame in that. And um, so that is another thing that that advocate office does. Um, we also ask them to see resident advisors, all sorts of people, because we want them to be able to see somebody they know. Uh, sometimes people are saying, okay, I'll go talk to my community director or my commuter assistant, but it feels weird to walk over to the advising center. So be aware that that support may be, um, and so Fritzy usually sends out a message when those go out. Yep. <laughs> it's a good time to ask your student and to check in with them about whether or not they got one of those letters and then what they're doing to get the help they need. Yep, 100%. Um, I see the, the meal plan is question. I'm gonna get to it just really quickly because I feel this is connected um, in regards to you know what students, how do students know what to bring in terms of books and materials that they're gonna need for classes. And so when a student registers for their courses, they get their you know, course schedule. Um, they can go onto the bookstore website and actually look up their courses to see exactly what the course materials are that are listed for that course. Um, also, in addition, um, students also receive a syllabus um, during the first week of classes. And so if there's any additional materials that are needed, students are advised at that point as well. But typically, the course materials list on the bookstore website is where students find information about what books um, that they're going to need for their classes that semester. Um, and I believe uh, student, you can order your books from the bookstore online. I don't know when the cutoff is, but you could place your orders online and pick them up during the move in day. Um, a lot of students do that or we've seen some families, um, the students just go ahead and do that a little bit prior to and just make a visit to campus and come pick up their books at that point just to kind of get it out of the way. So it really just depends on, uh, upon kind of what um, you all are able to do for your with your student at that time. So wanted to touch on that um, really quickly before we moved on to the meal plan. Um, Let me say too, yeah. I just want to mm -hmm. touch on this must be for day one. Mm -hmm. um, must be for day one has changed a lot since COVID. Our yeah. faculty, I was just talking to one of our, um, actually an engineering faculty member who's spending lots of time putting really popular music in all of his course materials right now because he wants it to be more exciting. Um, but they've learned a lot during COVID about how to reach out for students and more and more faculty, the first day was just get acquainted and here's your syllabus yeah. and let's move on. But now that they know how to distribute those materials digitally, um, I would hazard to guess that some of your students are gonna get some of those materials or their Blackboard, which is our place where students go to access all of their digital course materials, sometimes to turn in papers or to see lecture notes um, or to get grades even on what they've put in and back forth. That Blackboard may be open even before the first day of classes. And I've even seen faculty members start to give assignments that they should have ready to talk about on the first day of class. A little more unusual in the first year, but just make sure your student knows that they're checking in because what you need on first day one has changed a lot and probably will continue to change and is unique to each course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so any advice? Yes. Yeah, so classes start on Wednesday, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so, yes, they do have a few days to get books. If they, um, the only thing I would say about that, I mean, they, sh you know, sometimes, you know, it's, it, I don't think that they've run out of books uh, too much, but it's just one of those things that you don't want to be in a situation where perhaps you can't get the books uh, as soon as you want. And so, I always say Aaron the side of caution of kind of getting them the earlier, the better. So that that's 1 less thing your student has to think about um, during move in week. Um, but if 
your students still unsure about their classes and you're still kind of making decisions, then yes, absolutely, the bookstore will be available and students can go um, and pick up their books at that time. Um, the meal plan. We always get questions about the meal plan, <laughs> particularly for residential students and how do we figure this out? Um, and so there's so many options available. I'm going to drop the what they call the mile, the my meal plan assistant, which is actually a survey that the dining services has provided that you can go through and fill it out and they make a recommendation on a meal plan. So I'm going to drop that resource in the chat. Um, one thing to know is that you can change your meal plan option um, we, 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 uh, during the first two weeks of the semester. So say if you pick the, the biggest one and after the first few days or the first week, your student says, you know what, I don't think I'm going to need the unlimited <laughs> option. You can bump that down um, to a different meal plan or if you purchase a smaller option and your student says, I need more meals, then you could bump it up to a, a bigger option during the first two weeks. After the, the first two weeks, you still can make changes, but you could only move up in your meal plan. So if you chose something that was smaller and your student says to you after the first two weeks, I need more meals, you can move up your meal plan. But that is the only option available after two weeks. Um, I, oh, mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Tomorrow there is a, a virtual session. Yes, uh, thank you. Okay. You just you jumped on God. I was gonna. You stole my thunder. <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I was gonna say that the um, dining services. I sent out an announcement to the new family group. This uh, new summer family orientation group this afternoon that dining services is actually also doing a virtual drop in session tomorrow evening. I think it's from like 4 to 5 if I remember correctly. So absolutely check out the meal plan assistant. If that still is not answering your questions, if you want to drop into the, that that session tomorrow, that's an option too. And that all else fails, they will always respond to families. And so you can always shoot me an email at families at umbc.edu and I can get you connected to someone in dining services to get your question answered. So hopefully that covers it. Um, there was one more question I wanted to try to squeeze in before we said goodnight, because I because we got a lot of questions about it. Um, so the question that we got a lot about is campus activities in general. Um, things to do on the weekend, um, you know, how do we, you know, how do students get connected to those activities and stay kind of involved in that? And are there plans to kind of increase activities, um, you know, this semester, obviously, given all the things that have happened since COVID and things of that nature? Yeah. So right now we are planning to be up and running. Um, I am watching the COVID reports every day and um, working with that epidemiologist that we consult with. And we had expected to see COVID flatten by this week, and it is peaking, we're hoping. And um, our, our hope is that by the time they arrive, we'll be flat and then ready for that time in October and that we can do as many face to face physical kind of activities as possible. And that includes weekends. For those weekend events, um, we are trying, we usually try in the first six weeks of school until all of the organizational activities start, right? After that, when the organizational activities start, um, you see a different kind of activity. There's still tons of things to do, but we have soccer games. Um, we have um, all sorts of sporting activities that take place on weekends and soccer. We have the, I, I think, I don't know what the exact number is since COVID hit, but prior to COVID, we had the third highest attendance at soccer games. And I tell people that tell us we don't have football teams. Well, you're just not a very international school because we all know we have a football team um, because most of the world thinks of soccer as football and our students certainly go out in full force. So that is sort of part of our sporting community, um, as well as many other fall sports that students um, attend and get really excited about. We have recreation and club sports. We have gaming tournaments. So even if it's not a big activity, there are many things to do on weekends, intellectual competitions. Um, we are in the process. Students told us they wanted a lot more hangout spaces. 
So True Grits has entertainment and is open for late night all weekends. So that if students don't want an active um, thing that they can just go hang out. We have movies. Um, we have um, partnerships with people in the nearby community, whether that's Okamoka, which is a coffee shop run by some of our alums that they started while they were in an entrepreneurial class um, in their junior and senior year at UMBC. And they are all still running it and still hiring our students. And it is a big UMBC hangout and they do events down there on weekends as well. So there will definitely be things to do. It's helping them find out. We've got a weekend calendar that they can click on and Fritzy usually shares that with families too. So when they call you and say there's nothing to do, you can say, oh really? Because in the parent newsletter, it says there's X. Have you thought about going there? And that's kind of a helpful thing to do. And then they say, yeah, that's pretty beat. And you're like, well, how do you know? Did you go? And then they go and they go, oh, that was really fun. Um, so um, that's probably the best answer I have for you. But again, if your students having trouble connecting, we're happy to help with that. Yes, um, I will add that I most certainly do try to keep families informed about any kind of big ticket events that are ha happening on campus need to know. Um, the other piece that I will share is that a lot of times students will say there's nothing to do because perhaps they may drive onto campus and it looks like there's nothing happening, right? Um, or they maybe look down their hallway and maybe everyone has their door closed. But if they go into the commons or if they go into the university center ballroom or if they go into different spaces, there are activities that they just have to find out where they are. Um, and so I will on the parent portal, I'm going to show you really quickly. Um, you will see that I have um, added upcoming an upcoming events tab here so there families can see if you have a student who's saying i don't there's nothing to do you could actually pull that up and see oh actually this weekend we have x happening right um, these are all the things that are happening this weekend why don't you go check that out your student has access to this as well but sometimes they may not necessarily remember those things are available. And so just a, a gentle nudge from you is always helpful. <laughs> um, and then honestly, once they get connected to a club and organization, that's really a lot of where those activities kind of fill in for them as well. Um, and then as if they're living on campus, the residential life department is doing programming in the halls. Um, if they're commuter students, the, the office of off campus student services, they're doing programming. So once they find their community, a lot of the events start to fill in that way too. So I think that all the questions for the most part are topics, but I wanted to make sure I covered what's next. So Nancy, did you have any final thoughts? Before I do. I, I, yeah. I first mm -hmm. of all, just thank you for showing up because mm -hmm. we know you've gotten them here. We appreciate that you trust us with your most precious projects um, of a lifetime. And um, I, I like to think that we take that as seriously as you do. And I often tell people I have 15,000 children mm -hmm. and every one of them matters to us. So thank you for your trust in that partnership. Um, I know that lots of parents and all the books out there and even in our own orientation program, we tell you that you need to help them become independent. And I want to reiterate, I see it just a little bit differently. Yes, you want to help them, but we also know there's different cultural values around independence and that's a pretty mainstream way of thinking. Um, and so what I'd like you to do is think about the fact that you've been teaching them to ride a bike with training wheels. And you're about to take those training wheels off. And the first time you take the training wheels off, you run right by them because you're afraid they're gonna crash. And so we don't want you to take those training wheels off and go, yep, you're on your own. <laughs> don't put on a helmet, we're good. Um, you know, we want you there with us to say that, um, you know, we're taking your training wheels off, but we're gonna be right by your side. We're here when you need us. Hey, did you put on your helmet? I know you know, you didn't need me to remind you about that, but we're just checking in because we're worried and you know, we're still your parents. And then you ask those questions a little more frequently. And then one day you look up and they're riding without you and it's incredibly happy and incredibly sad, but you've gotten them there. But in this first semester, when we take off those training reels, we're gonna be running alongside of them, but we want you to be doing that with us. And so I just thank you for coming and asking all these questions because you're gonna be better prepared to be in that partnership with us. 
and I look forward to helping you and your students have the best first semester you can possibly have. Yes, 100%. Couldn't have said that better uh, myself. Um, we know these questions, um, you know, we didn't maybe get to all your questions and you may have future questions or concerns. Oh, now I'm crying. No crying. <laughs> um, and so um, what will happen after the end of this session, you will get a follow up email from me um, that just again, thanks you for attending this evening. Um, and obviously our follow up our contact information. You can always email us at families at umbc.edu. We will respond really quickly and get you uh, connected to the right place or, or jump on a call with you to talk it through. Um, so please continue to use that as a resource for you. If I didn't get to your specific question or, or cover your topic today, my hope is to run through that list and follow up with you personally. Um, so within the next few days, you may get an email from me to say, hey, I'm sorry we didn't get to your question. Here's the information that you're looking for. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we will be posting this recording um, on the Family Connection portal. Portal. So if you missed anything um, in our conversation, that will be available for you too. And I will send out a message once that's posted and available. So thank you all so much. This was such a great conversation. Um, I hope it was informative. I'm seeing the thank yous. Um, and we hope that this is a, the start of a beautiful conversation and a partnership of working with your student. And we can't wait to see you um, on opening day, August 27th, whether you're moving your student into the residence hall or dropping your commuter or transfer student off um, for a commuter transfer welcome day. We can't wait to welcome you all officially to the UNBC family. So thank you. Uh, we'll let you go this evening. It's been wonderful and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye-bye now. Good night. Thank you. Good night. You're welcome. Take thank care. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs> Bye.